Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Solid Life's weekly message. And just before we jump into the message today, let me encourage you to consider getting into a group and going through the brand new materials called Jesus Commission and Jesus Disciple and Disciple Maker. So the green book, Jesus Commission, and by the way, these materials are available free of charge at the Jesus Disciple app. If you don't have that app, I encourage you to download the app and go through the green book, Jesus Disciple, excuse me, Jesus Commission, which will train you how to use the blue book, Jesus Disciple and Disciple Maker. Uh, when you gather together with believers, I encourage you to move quickly, get through all the information, get all the way through the training, each lesson, and the setting of goals, because those two things at the end are the teeth that really make the whole process work. Okay, so if you want to become a disciple maker and want others to become a disciple maker, or I should say, if you want to start a movement, then I encourage you to get in a group together for a Jesus Commission group study, and it'll train you how to use the Jesus Disciple and Disciple Maker book. Okay, now, we've got a message for you today. I want you to open your heart to receive because God always has something to say that will encourage us, that will strengthen us, and that will lead us in these dark days in which we live. So, open your heart to receive, and let's go now to the message. If you would, I'd like to have you share with me to the book of Luke in chapter number seven, to the book of Luke in chapter number seven. I like us to start reading at verse number 36 in Luke chapter number seven. We're going to read from verse number 36 all the way down to verse number 50. Is that a lot of reading? Oh, no, I know you guys can handle it. Okay. And so we're all reading out of the same. <laughs> he says, I don't know if I can. Okay. <laughs> So we're all reading out of the same Bible. We're going to be reading out of the New King James Version. There are a lot of good translations, but just so that we're all reading the same words, the New King James, if you don't have that, you can simply follow along on the screens. Let's begin. Then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. Now, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me stop again. Let's all read together. I, I, I may not have enunciated that properly, so let me try to get it. Let's all, A-L-L, -L, read together, okay? <laughs> Let's start again at verse number 36. Then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil and stood at his feet behind him weeping. And she began to wash his feet with her tears and wiped him with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself saying, this man, if he were a prophet, would know who what manner of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. So he said, teacher, say it. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to, you, to him, you have judged rightly. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore, I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. And those who sat at the table with them began to say to themselves, who is this who even forgives sin? Then he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading, to the hearing, and more importantly, to the application of his word. It is interesting that this particular story is in the book of Luke, and the book of Luke is one of the synoptic gospels. 
Synoptic simply means S-Y-N, sin means uh, same, and optic means to view or to see. So we're looking at the life of Jesus through pretty much the same lens in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John takes a whole different approach, and about 90% of what's in the book of John isn't found in the book of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But it's interesting, this story that we read here in the book of Luke isn't found in Matthew or Mark. Now, there are other records records of Jesus being anointed in some of the other uh, gospels, but it's not in, it's not the same story that we find in the book of Luke. It's interesting that there are three or maybe even four different times that uh, uh, Jesus is anointed. One of those times is in Matthew chapter number 26, verses six through 13. And there it says he was at the house of Simon the leper. Now he's at the house of a Simon, but he sure is, surely isn't a leper, he's a Pharisee in the story that we're reading in the book of Luke. But in John chapter number 12, there's also a story of Jesus being anointed. But in John chapter 12, he's anointed by Mary. And Mary does wipe his, his, his uh, feet with her hair, but he's in the house of Lazarus. This is the only account that's found in Luke chapter number seven. This is the account of uh, 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 a unnamed woman being at the house of Simon the Pharisee. Now he's a Pharisee. And Pharisees were interesting people. Now, you need to understand, Pharisees started off uh, wanting to purify the relationship of the people of God with God. But they used the law to try to do that. The problem is the law was never meant to show that we were righteous. The law was meant to show that we were sinners and we couldn't keep the law. So what they had to do to try to make it look like they were keeping the law, they they introduced a number of traditions. And those traditions sort of circled the law. And you had to go through all of these hoops to try to show that you, uh, abiding by these traditions, have fulfilled the law. And Jesus came. And he came to be the end of the law of righteousness for everyone that believes. Because we could never keep the law on our own. So this is a Pharisee. Now, we don't know why he invited Jesus to his house. The Bible doesn't say. He could have invited Jesus because he just wanted to get to know him. He's heard so much about him uh, that that he wanted to spend time to get to know him. I don't think that was the reason, but it could have been. Uh, He could obviously have brought Jesus in because he was a celebrity. And you need to understand something. And those days when someone brought a celebrity or brought someone who was well known into their house, they had a party. In other words, uh, their home was open up to the public. You need to hear me now. There were some people who would be invited to this gathering. They were invited guests. But even though they were invited guests, and at that era of time, the the house of this well-to-do or this house of this Pharisee would be open to everybody. In other words, any of the public could come by. You would open your gate and people would walk in. You couldn't eat a meal there, but you could stand around the wall and hear what's going on. You see, they didn't have TV. They didn't have news or newspapers or what have you. So this is one of the ways that people began to know what was happening. They would attend some of these parties and sit on the side of the wall and listen to what was transpiring. And that's exactly what was happening at the home of Simon the Pharisee. His home was opened up and people were coming. People that he invited and people that were just from the neighborhood, and they would all show up. But there was one he didn't think would show up. There was a woman who had a notorious reputation as being a sinner. We're not sure what her sin was. Many people said it was fornication. She was a a prostitute, a harlot, but we don't know that the Bible doesn't say, but whatever it was, everybody knew it. And no one expected her to show up to this. But she showed up. And, 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 wait, 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 wait. She not only showed up, but the Bible says why she showed up. She showed up in order to see Jesus. Look at what it says in the book of Luke, chapter number seven, and at verse number 37. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, bought an alabaster flask oil, or alabaster flask of fragrant oil. I want to say, the reason why she was there was because Jesus was there. That's the only reason why she came. And she knew when she came that she would not be a welcome guest because of the reputation she had. And of all the places she was going to, 
it happened to be a Pharisee's party. But she came. Now, why did she come? Uh, it, it could be that she heard that Jesus was there and, and she wanted to see Jesus, but she's bringing an alabaster flask as if she wanted to give something to Jesus. And when she's coming, she's not asking for anything. As a matter of fact, she's coming to give something to Jesus. As if she knew him. And, you know, sometimes my mind just goes wild. So you have to forgive me on some things. Because there's something that's interesting to me. If you were to take a look at the book of Luke in chapter number seven and just go back a few verses, let's say to verse number 31. And the Lord said to what then shall I liken the men of this generation? So these are events that took place before Luke 7, 36. To, and the Lord said to what then shall I liken the men of this generation? And what are they like? Verse 32, they are like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to one another saying, we played the flute for you and you did not dance. We mourned to you and you did not weep. For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and you said he's a, he has a demon. Verse 34, the son of man has come eating and drinking, and you say, look, a glutton and a wine bibber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is justified by all her children. Now, I mean, we're not going to go into a, a detail of, of, of what we just read. I just want to point out to you that if you were to go back to the book of Matthew and chapter number 11, you would find some of those same words in Matthew chapter number 11, starting at verse number 17, and saying, we played the flute for you, you did not dance. We mourned to you, you did not lament. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and you say he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking. They say, look, a glutton and a wine bibber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is justified by her children. All I'm trying to point out to you is that we find the same story in the book of Matthew that we find in the book of Luke. Now, Luke begins to go and follow a different path. From, from that statement, he goes and talks about this Pharisee. But Matthew continues on with what took place. And one of the things that Matthew says is in Matthew chapter number 11, verse number 28, one of my favorite scriptures, well, I have a lot of favorite scriptures, one of my favorite scriptures, where he says, come to me, all you who labor are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Could it be that the woman was there when Jesus spoke those words? And something began to change on the inside of her. I'm not here today to speak as much to your mind. And as, as important as that is, I want to speak to your heart. Because I remember what transformed me. It didn't start up here. It started in here. Could it be that she heard Jesus preach, maybe even speak those words, and all of a sudden, a light turned on on the inside of her. She heard a calling from God to her. As messed up as her life was. She believed that the Lord was calling her. Mine was almost the opposite. I was doing well when the Lord called me. I thought, why are you messing up my life? <laughs> Had a good job. I was doing all right, but I heard a knock. And I knew I could have said no, but there was a sense that you don't know how many more times you will have that knock and be able to hear it. So I opened the door. It wasn't that I opened the door with my mind. I opened the door with my heart. I said, Lord, I don't even know how to get in touch with my heart. 
I was groomed to only use this because then you wouldn't be hurt as much. I was groomed to only use this because you can get through life easier. But he began to talk to me in here. Maybe some of you that are out there, you've experienced that. And if you haven't, I'm hoping that you'll open up your heart to experience it. Now, we don't know whether that's true, but think about it. She's coming just to see Jesus. And she's bringing something to give to him. Oh, wait a minute. Everybody else is coming to get something. She's coming to give something because she already got something. She found that she could come unto him. All you that labor are heavy laden, and he would give rest. So now she hears that he's coming to this Pharisee's house. And so she goes. Even knowing that she would not be well received, she still goes. Now, you need to know something about those days. Not only did they open up the courtyard to anyone that was in the town, but even though we look at the pictures of Michelangelo or others, we see the disciples sitting on chairs on, around the table. That's not quite the way it was in those days. They had what they call couches. And you would lay on the couch, low-hanging couches or low-level couches. And you would sort of rest, most, since most people were right-handed, you, left on, you sort of lean on your left side. Leaning on this couch, your feet would be out here. I, I would show it to you, but I don't know how to do that and still be able to stand, okay? <laughs> so the feet was pointing out in the back. And you're leaning on the table. You, with your right hand, you could reach and you could get food off the table. But there was something. When a guest came in, the hospitality of that day said that the host, or at least one of his servants, would come and make sure that every guest, remember, Jesus was an invited guest, that every guest that came in, that that guest would receive a hug, a kiss on the cheek. There would be a, a servant, or also host himself, would make sure that the feet were clean. Now, we have what we call foot washing services today. I remember when I did foot washing, I, my feet were clean when I got there because I made sure if there's never a time I cleaned my feet, I cleaned my feet before the foot washing surface, all right? You took off your shoes, took off your socks, you made sure you bathed them. Not only did you make sure you bathed them, you make sure that you had put some oil on them so they wouldn't be what we call ashy. You don't even know what I mean by that saying, but everybody else who's an African-American, you know what I mean by ashy, right? So you make sure that they were all glistening or that you even put some perfume on your feet, all right? So when we went in for a foot washing service, we didn't need to have our feet washed. But when they went in for a foot washing service, it was entirely different. The shoes that they wore, they were really nothing more than a little piece of leather on the bottom of their sole. And the streets, they weren't paved. And every critter known was walking on those streets. There was a special place that they would go to in order to relieve themselves. Wherever they were, that's what they did. And so you're walking through all of that. So every home you went into, it wasn't just a someone being hospitable. It was a necessary thing to have your feet washed. Jesus was invited to this party. He wasn't greeted with a kiss. He didn't have his feet washed. There was not a towel there to dry his feet because his feet weren't even washed. And this woman, who I believe had an encounter with Jesus, an encounter that transformed her life so much so that she wanted to see him again. And not to see him in order to ask him for anything, but to see him to thank him for what it is he had done. She was no longer the same. Something had happened on the inside of her. She probably didn't understand all of it, but something happened. Have you noticed something when we read through the story? She never says a word. Jesus speaks for her. So here she is. She looks at Jesus and she says, I didn't come.
prepared to wash your feet, but you can't go like that. Who you are, who I am. So she goes and starts wiping his feet and she's so overcome with emotion that tears begin to run down her face. Those tears fall on his feet and she's able now to have a little bit of liquid to use to wash, but she needs something to dry his feet with. She doesn't have anything but her hair. She was willing to take anything she had in order to give it to him. She didn't have the conveniences that were there. She didn't ask anyone to help her because she knew that she wasn't welcomed here, but she wanted to give to Jesus all that she had. And so she gave it. All that the Pharisee could see was that this woman who was of ill repute, Jesus allowed himself to be touched by her. Even the word that's translated touch, it has a sort of a sexual um, connotation. And Jesus was allowing himself to be touched by this woman. And then the Pharisee says this, obviously he doesn't know who she is, but wait, they tell me he's a prophet. Obviously he's not a prophet. He doesn't even know who she is. Then Jesus does something that is marvelous. He tells a parable. A parable that is meant to talk directly to this Pharisee. See, the Bible says when the Pharisee said, this can't be a prophet, he didn't know who she was. He didn't say that out loud. He thought it in his head. But Jesus, wanting to show that he's even more than who the Pharisee thought he might have been, without him saying a word, say, I want to talk to you. And he tells this parable. It's a very simple parable. There are two debtors. One owed a little, another owed a lot. But they had one thing in common. Listen to this. Neither one could pay their debts. Oh, let me say in this crowd, we all have different debts. I know when I came to the Lord, I had a debt. But it's different than your debt. And we can spend time arguing about our debts. But the bottom line is, no matter how long we argue, we can't pay off the debt. Because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And there's only one who has no sin, and his name is Jesus. So we all are in need of the same Savior. And so then he said, but wait, 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 let me ask you this question. If there were two people that had debts and one was a little debt, one was a great debt, which one do you think would love more? He said, well, I don't really even want to answer that question, but probably the one that owed the bigger debt. And all of a sudden, he's looking at this woman who had a huge debt. Jesus made it clear she had many sins. It wasn't he was trying to excuse the sins. But he said that no matter how great those sins were, she had a greater savior. I remember when the Lord came to me. I didn't know what was going on. But I knew this. I had to tell somebody. And this is what I did. I couldn't really articulate what was happening to me. So I grabbed a tape recorder. We had cassette tapes back in those days, just in case somebody was wondering, okay? Like, you didn't use your phone. We didn't have those kind of phones that that day, okay? Ours had a cord on it. Anyway, let me go back. Let me not go back that far. I would take that tape recorder. I would sit with my Bible. And I would send a recording. I said, Mom. I don't really know what's happening to me. But I had an encounter with Jesus. I don't even know what all that means. But something is different on the inside. There's a desire that I have to want to do things that I didn't have before. There are things that I wouldn't even consider twice 
doing. I would just do it. Now I can't do it anymore. And I don't know where all this is going to lead, but mom, I'm a different person on the inside. And the different person on the inside caused me to start doing things differently on the outside. That's what happened to this woman. She might have been a sinner yesterday, but she encountered Jesus, and now all of a sudden she's doing things differently on the outside because of what happened to her on the inside. That's what I want to talk to you about. It's the inside. If you can be changed on the inside, and if you look to him, what's on the inside will begin to be manifested on the outside. Because that's what happened to this woman. Jesus said, because she's been forgiven much, she loves much. I began to think about things in my life that nobody knew about but me and Jesus. Things that if people learned about, they would look at me the same way that they're looking at me, even in that day and age. But he says, I've forgiven you. And out of that forgiveness, minister to me. You know what the Bible says about ministering to the Lord Jesus? The Bible says, what you've done unto the least of men, you've done unto me, you've done unto Jesus. So all of a sudden, I began finding myself doing things I didn't think I would do. For me, it was very practical. I learned of a woman that had four children and she couldn't get a ride into church. And I said, I had to come from a long distance. Maybe I could stop by and pick them up and bring them to church. Didn't realize that was going to change my whole life. I mean, my whole life, because it's not over today. And they're grown kids now. (laughs) But there was a work going on on the inside. And if we're not careful, we'll miss that the Lord wants to do something on the inside. And if we miss it, we'll start to become like that Pharisee who are simply looking at what people are on the outside, not realizing that God could be doing a work on the inside. I wasn't the same person. Anthony, I wasn't the same person. When I looked in the mirror, I didn't see anything different. But over time, even what I looked at began to change. The Bible says it does not yet appear what you shall be, but when he shall appear, you shall be like him because you shall see him as he is. And all of a sudden, as I start reading the word, I start seeing him. And guess what? I started changing. And the Lord is still in the changing business. But he wants to work from the inside out. He started working from the inside out. And all of a sudden there were things that I couldn't do. That all of a sudden I could. I couldn't stand before a group and say anything. Because I would stutter so bad that I was simply be mocked. Remember I had to present a speech and I was, had to rehearse it in front of a group. There was only about three or four girls sitting in the audience. That was it. But as soon as I started talking, they started laughing. As soon as they started laughing, all of a sudden I couldn't talk anymore. I didn't cry because I had been taught you don't cry before people. But I was crushed on the inside. Then I was before another group of people and in the book of Romans chapter number eight, the Lord gave me this scripture. He says in verse number 29, let me set the stage for you. Some of you already know this testimony. I had finally got the confidence to share Jesus 
with two people. One I married, now you figure that she probably was partial to me anyway, right? Well, just shake your head, she was, okay? <laughs> and a dear friend of mine who's gone home to be with the Lord. That's all I had as a class, two people. And I was getting comfortable stuttering my way through two people. And I came in to teach that day. And you know what the pastor's wife did? She came down all excited. We're going to have a marvelous opportunity to get all the teachers together. And they're going to be able to present something for about 10 minutes, 15 minutes about their class. Isn't that exciting, Brother Carl? That was not exciting to me. <laughs> And back in those days, when something began to grip me, I would take a little walk. I took a little, a little walk around the, the, uh, the block, and I began to talk to the Lord. I said, Lord, you know this does not make any sense. <laughs> and as I was talking to him, all of a sudden, Romans 8 came to my mind. And it's Romans 8 and verse number 29 which says, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. I love that. But then it says in verse number 30, moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. And whom he called, these he also justified. And to whom he justified, these he also glorified. I said, Lord, are you telling me that you justified me to be able to go in there and to speak to those people? And you know, a yes or no would have been a great answer. <laughs> if he had said no, I would just leave, wouldn't, would just get in my car and go home. If he said yes, I would be shivering, but at least I know he said yes. And you know what he told me? You will find out tonight. <laughs> That's not what I wanted to hear. But he was doing a work on the inside. And, and sometimes when you plant a seed, you just look and you don't see anything, but one day it's going to sprout just a little sapling above the ground. And I remember standing in front of that audience. And it was the Old Testament. I asked a simple question. How many books are there in the Old Testament? Somebody said 66. I said, yes, there are only 39 books in the Old Testament. I was wrong to start off with. <laughs> But all of a sudden, an anointing came over me. And I found myself remembering things, tying things together that even I had not seen. Because I has not seen, neither his ear heard what it is that the Lord has prepared for those who love him. But he's revealed it by his spirit. And the spirit of a living God began to talk from the inside. I'm not all that I ought to be. I'm not all that I'm going to be. But each day, I'm a little different and that I'm more like him. And that's what the Lord wants for all of us. So this woman came unto Jesus and, 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 and I bethered that she was just horrified. He's a guest. And look at how they're treating a guest. No consideration. No honor. And he's the one that spoke to me and turned me upside down. I can't let him go without me offering unto him the little bit that I have. You might think you only have a little, but a little that's given unto Jesus turns out to be more than enough. Turns out to be a lot. So she gave what she had, whether it was the tears to wash his feet, whether it was the hair as to use as a towel, whether it were, no, I can't kiss your lips, I can't kiss your face, we don't want to have anything misunderstood, so I'm going to just kiss your feet. But she offered what she had. And those of us who know the Lord, are we offering to Jesus what we have? As little as it might seem to us, once it's in the hands of the master, it becomes not only enough, it becomes more than enough. So she ministers to him. But she's misunderstood. 
She's doing all this sobbing, all this weeping, and, and people are looking at her, and they're, they're not sure what's going on. Let me tell you, when you have your relationship with the Lord, other people may not understand, but you know, Lord, this is, I'm, this is no funny business. This is just me and you, and Lord, I love you. I thank you. Nobody knows what it is that you've done for me like what it is that you've done for me. So I am, I'm the only one who can say thank you. I'm the only one who can say I love you, and I thank you the way that I can. You can thank the Lord for you. But you can't thank the Lord for me because you don't know what he's done for me. Even if you knew what he's done, you don't know what it feels like to me. And he wants to minister in those areas. So you know the story. Jesus came and he talked to the man. Hopefully the man saw that he had missed this opportunity. He had looked at her based upon what she was not based upon who she now is and will yet be. And that's what I found even in my life. I mean, when, 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 my, when my family found out that I was preaching, you know what they said? How can that boy preach? He can't even talk. <laughs> because they knew me where I was not where the Lord has brought me. And since the change started on the inside, it's not always easy to see what's going on on the inside. But eventually what's on the inside will be manifested on the outside. I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, Jesus says, Because of your faith, you have experienced salvation. You've been saved. But she evidenced her salvation by showing the change that was taking place on the inside. She evidenced her salvation by the love that she had for Jesus. It wasn't her love that saved her. It was her faith that saved her. But because she had faith, she could increase in love and the love was evidence that she had faith. Does that make sense? So what about us? Are we allowing ourselves to evidence the love that we have for the Lord? She came to thank Jesus. But when she got there, there was opportunity to minister to Jesus. Do we see our opportunities to minister? She ministered to Jesus by wiping his feet. She ministered to Jesus by anointing him. How do we minister to Jesus today? I heard Jesus says, what you've done unto the least of men, you've done to me. So how many opportunities do we have to say thank you, Jesus? How many opportunities do we have to appreciate the generosity that he's shown to us? We can minister to him, but we'll minister to him as we minister to those who he wants to reach. He's looking for people that he can minister to, and then he can minister through that other people would know that he is alive, he is real. What about you? Do you have a story? I came in here today and as I was driving in, there was an old song. Unfortunately, I can't sing, so I'm not gonna sing you the song because I'd hate to have the, uh, everyone tell Pastor Jerry that I'm sorry, but when Pastor Carl started singing, everybody got up and left. <laughs> I'd rather not have that happen, so I'm not going to do that. Does anybody remember Andre Crouch? Okay. He sang a song. He entitled it, Take Me Back. Take me back. Take me back, dear Lord, to the place 
where I first received you. Maybe you didn't have my experience, but there was something that took place when I first received you. I was so embarrassed by what it did on the inside of me, I had to go home and just simply talk to him myself. Take me back, dear Lord, to the place where I first received you. Take me back, take me back, dear Lord, listen to this, where I first believed. There was something that was so fresh, something that was so overwhelming, I can't live in that place for the rest of my salvation, but I can every now and then recall who I was becoming. Because when you walk in this life, your feet get dirty. You sometimes find yourself tripped up by things. I don't know if I have the time to tell that story. I remember when I was in college, we had a giant snowstorm and it knocked out the power to my dorm. Our dorm was a little house that had about eight or 10 men in it. And all of a sudden we were on a hill and, and down the hill I could see that there was this store that was open and I said, you know, I don't know how many batteries I have. If I can make it to that store, let me, get, let me see if I can get some batteries. The lights were out on the street, but I've walked that street so many times I knew where everything was. So I started walking down the hill. And all of a sudden, I got a little more than halfway down the hill. And I found myself tangled up in what I thought was bushes. You know, on, at least on the East Coast, we have what we call hedges. They're, they're, they're simply bushes on the side of the road that sort of let you know where the road ends. And I found myself in these, what I thought were hedges or these bushes. And I had to fight my way out, but I had to go get these batteries. So I went all the way down there and I got the batteries. And about the same spot, I came back up and you know what? I found myself tangled up again. I said, what is going on here? I don't remember these bushes being here. The next morning, it was cold, ice cold. You know, you could see the, the sky glitter because there was no clouds in the sky. It was crystal clear. The storm had cleared. And I looked down the hill where I thought I was tangled up in bushes. The power line had fallen because of all of the ice. And what I thought I was entangled in these hedges or these bushes, I was entangled with electric power lines. And I slipped and I'm soaking wet. Take me back, dear Lord, to the place where I first received you. I want you to experience him in here. Because if you can see him in here, everything else will take care of itself. Take me back. Take me back. Take me back to you, Lord. To the place where I Take me back. Take me back. Take me back, dear Lord, where I first be. Some of you might take you a little while just to remember what that was like. But if you had any sort of experience like I had, it leaves an indelible mark in your life. And I'm telling you, every now and then you got to recall that. He changed me. He made me new. I'm not the same person that I used to be. He's not finished with me yet. I'm still a work in progress. But I got to remember where I started from. Say, Lord, thank you. Lord, if I can wash your feet, I'd be privileged to do it. Lord, if I could talk to who you want me to talk to, let me do that. Because you talked with me. And I'm not the same. Take me back, dear Lord. Take me back. Take me back, dear Lord. To the 
She had a testimony. She heard Jesus was around and she made it her business to try to get to Jesus. Even though she could have just simply said, they won't even let me in, so why do I even want to try? Oh, try anyhow. You never know what might happen when you get there. Because the one that changed your life and opened up doors and made ways, he's still the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. There's nothing that's too hard for him. The devil wants us to stop just short of the blessing that the Lord has for us. But we're not ignorant of his wiles, of his schemes. And so we persevere. We wait on him. We believe in him. He who knew no sin became sin for me that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Can you just say a few things with me? As we prepare to dismiss. Dear Lord, Dear Lord I, thank I thank you for sending Jesus. For sending Jesus. He, is he is the good shepherd. And the good shepherd gave his life for the sheep. So today, if I know him, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I may not be who I'm going to be, but I'm not what I used to be. And I thank you, O oh Lord, that you do all things well. You are the Lord, my shepherd, and I shall not want. You've given me exceeding great and precious promises that by these I might be partakers of the divine nature. So Lord, take me back. Take me back. Take me back, dear Lord, to the place where I first received you. Take me back. Take me back, dear Lord, where I get me wrong I'm not saying that there won't be tests or trials I'm not saying that sometimes it looks like there are things that happen to you that lay you flat out but I'm here to tell you he that promised is faithful we might be faithless but he's faithful he cannot deny who he is have you not heard have you not seen that the Lord the everlasting father he neither faints yeah. nor is weary. Right. And he's for you. When you look in the mirror, you may not see anything for him to be for, but he sees so much more because he's come to dwell on the inside of you. He's given us the precious gift of the Holy Spirit who begins to work from the inside Amen. out. So it does not yet appear what you shall be. But when he shall appear, you're going to be like him. And you're going to see him for who he is. I want to encourage us this week. As the Lord begins to minister to you, let him remind you of what he's done within your life. Not for you to wind up dwelling in what he has done because he's still doing things. But just so that I can remind myself when the devil says it's not worth it, when the devil says you can't make it, look at where I've already come from. And I know him a lot more now. I know.
know that he's faithful to his word. Let's just sing that one more time. Take me back. Take me back, dear Lord, to the place where I first received you. Take me back. Take me back, dear Lord, where I God, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for meeting us here. Yes, and talking to our heads, but more so talking to our hearts. For you said we shall love the Lord our God with all of our hearts, with all of our soul, and with all of our mind. Help us, O oh Lord, to remember how much you love us, that we can say, here is love. Not that we love him, but that he loved us. And because you did love us, we are here today, revived in your love. In Jesus' name.